we come to the Lord's table each week to obey Jesus' command to remember him. And as I was preparing my heart to lead this time this morning, I was encouraged to keep my mind focused on the eternal and the promises of what God will do when he returns. So that's what I want us to do this morning together. Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to put one in your hand. There are men in the front that have them and we'll hand them out. Uh, just raise your hand um, and they'll come to you and give you one. Um, this Bible is yours to keep if you don't have it. Um, it's such a sweet world that we live in where we can have God's word written and on our laps and to be able to worship him by reading what he would want us to see about himself. And so we're looking at Romans 8. We're going to look at one verse this morning. We're going to look at Romans 8, verse 18. So let me read that for you. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. There is one active verb in this verse. That word is consider. It isn't a contemplative consideration, but more like a firm belief. Paul is saying that I have unequivocally concluded. And so what has he concluded? That's what we need to take notice of this morning. And he's concluded of one thing, an eternal perspective. Paul compares two things. In two periods of time, he's looking at our present state, a state of suffering, one in which all of creation is groaning, and he described this state that we're in right now as being characterized by sufferings. Paul's focus here on suffering is general. Paul writes later, the sufferings of this present period, all of them, of whatever kind they may be, and we need comfort and assurance, not only when we suffer for Christ, but also when we endure other sufferings. And that's what Paul's trying to do here. I believe this suffering is, is purely just our existence here on earth in a fallen world. We see sin and death at every turn. And this is what Paul is helping us remove from our focus. If our focus was solely on this world, it would be debilitating. And so he does something for us to adjust our perspective. And what does he do? He places all of our suffering in one pan on a scale and the coming glory in the other pan. The pan with our suffering flies away as if it were completely empty. When sufferings and glory are held against each other, the sufferings amount to nothing, no matter how many and how severe they are. This is not an overstatement, but a simple fact. When we are in the midst of suffering, we often give them too much consideration. We fail to look at the coming glory, and we lose our balance or our sense of proportion. Don't misread this. Paul is not minimizing suffering. Suffering is hard, and he felt some of the worst of it. What he is communicating is the greatness of the glory to come. Paul set these sufferings over and against the coming glory saying that they are not worth comparing with it. Troublesome as they are to those of us who experience them, they are of no weight when set against the glory that awaits God's people. Paul also has this idea elsewhere. He speaks of them as light momentary troubles, as achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So here he looks forward to that glory that will be revealed. There's a touch of a certainty about will, which is not simply the future, but a separate verb. The glory will be revealed, not created. The implication here is that that glory is already in existence. It's just not apparent. The glory, he says, will be revealed in us, whereas preposition is not the one we might have expected. He may mean that in the coming age of all that is involved in our being sons of God will become apparent, and that this revelation in us is it is in us as well as to us. John MacArthur reminds us, as followers of Christ, our sufferings come from men, whereas our glory comes from God. Our suffering is earthly, and our glory is heavenly. Our suffering is short, and our glory is forever. Our suffering is trivial, 
and her glory is limitless. Our suffering is in our mortal, corrupted bodies, and our glory will be in our perfected and imperishable bodies. We shall be included in the radiance of the coming glory, which will put a shadow on the present sufferings. It will be a reflected glory, reflected from the Lord in his glory, that will make the saints radiant when they return to earth with the Lord Jesus. Of course, in this passage, Paul is thinking of Christians. For others cannot compare their sufferings with some future glory. So Christian, use this time with the bread and the cup to reflect on what God has done in your life and how the things of this world are without weight compared to the coming glory in the next. Keep an eternal perspective. Ephesians 2 tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works so that you may boast. If you have not committed your life in faith in Christ, this is not a sweet statement for you. These sufferings is the best that you're going to see. And so I plead with you, put your faith in Christ. Talk to me after the service. There will be people over here that would love to pray with you and talk to you about the gospel. But please let the elements pass by this morning. Consider, are you one that trusts in the work that Jesus did on the cross? Can you look forward to the coming glory and eternity with us and with him? If you can, if the answer to those questions are yes, take communion on your own. But if not, please let the cup pass by. Men, go ahead and serve us this morning, and I'll come back and pray.